Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna do a quick question and answer, somewhat of an interview me, question and answer mix, but let's just dive on in. All right, so first question here is, can I work as a quant if I have a hand tattoo? So this is actually a good question. Um, traditional finance, it might be very challenging. I don't think it's impossible, um, but extremely challenging. But quantitative finance, a lot of us just don't care. Um, we're usually back office. So like, I don't have clients, I don't see like, people that are hands-on that make important decisions for this, right? Um, I'm working on numbers and data, having a hand tattoo, not really a big deal. I actually worked with a buddy of mine who had a complete sleeve. So while he had a shirt on, it was hidden. But when we worked in our atmosphere, we were allowed to wear short sleeve shirts and he wore short sleeves all the time and had an entire sleeve. So quant finance, no, I don't really think it matters. Like if you have a good academic background, you're smart, um, you're bright, right? And you're excited and you wanna be there and work, don't think it matters in quant finance. It's one advantage of being in quant finance. Um, if you worked in traditional finance, though, like I mentioned, this might make um, a really big hurdle out of getting a job in traditional banking and finance. All right, next question here. Have you found stochastic processes useful? If so, which ones? Um, and could you explain how you use them? Okay, so to make this short as a short answer, have you found stochastic processes useful? Yes, they are useful. Uh, to follow up on which ones though, stochastic processes are just time series. That's a stochastic processes. Uh, it's a random process that is generated from a distribution itself. That's what makes it a stochastic processes. It has to start at zero in some point in time. And then when it starts at zero, it randomly deviates based on the distributions behind it, which makes it a stochastic processes. It's randomness that we're modeling. Um, are they useful? Yes, of course. Anything time series related, so like modeling time series, you know, like an ARIMA model, these are all stochastic processes. Understanding stochastic calculus, which is the mathematics for calculating, for example, like area under the curve um, for a stochastic processes is going to have to use stochastic calculus. Yes, it is useful. It is ex extremely useful in um, financial engineering applications, so derivative pricing. Again, you can learn a lot of that but once you learn like the Black-Scholes, for example, you would have to actually deviate from that because the Black-Scholes has so many assumptions behind it that are not realistic. To get more accurate pricing, to beat your competitors, you have to change the equations. When you do this, there is no closed form solution and you actually have to calculate out more complicated um, answers to these questions and how you set the price for these exotic options and derivative products. Um, I use them all the time. I've worked in C-car modeling. It's why I can build models that are stable for long periods of time, whereas others in the industry do not build such as robust models because they don't understand stochastic calculus and properties of stochastic processes. So yeah, they're useful. Um, which ones, again, there's not really like buckets. Like I wouldn't say there's like this type of stochastic processes, this type. Um, you can learn when you do stochastic processes in general, uh, stock price is typically trend. So trend component, which is your basic linear projection. And then there's a stochastic component, which is the randomness of it. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the math and theory on this, but yes, they're useful. Um, yeah, you can use them in risk management, pricing, and all kinds of areas in finance. Um, next question here. What were the most difficult things you faced in your first job? And also, what are the main difference between being a good student and a good worker? Um, and how was the transition college to business? So to start off with the first question here, the hardest part was just catching up. So a lot of times you're gonna join a team, they're already doing something, they've been doing it for five, 10, 15, 20, 30 plus years. They know all the ins and outs. You're the new guy. Um, most companies in quant finance do not offer training. So when you hit the ground, you hit the ground running, you have to catch up to everybody. There is no like someone holding your hand and explaining how things are done. So I think the hardest thing in my first job was just catching up to everybody else and getting on that playing field. Um, if you wanna be treated like an adult and you want your opinions taken seriously, you have to catch up and you have to catch up quickly. A lot of guys that start and a lot of people that start in general don't catch up quickly and then they're treated like junior analysts and then they complain they don't get ahead a lot of times. And it's just because being able to catch up with that curve is just challenging, probably the most difficult piece um, of the job. So the second question here, the difference between being a good student and a good worker, um, I would say it's the exact same. So I think most students who get good GPA and they think they're a good student, no one cares about GPA, at least I don't really care about it. Like, yeah, it's a good indication of like effort and abilities. But what I have found is a lot of 
different individuals and cultures embrace things such as cheating and they want to do as best they can on the exams um that's fine as a student i can like i look down upon you 100 percent. like you're a horrible person if you're cheating out there to get better scores and better exams and get that job right um you're not going to be that great in the real world you're going to struggle terribly because when you hit the real world to be a good worker you need perseverance you need the ability to learn on your own um Again, being very technical is important, but also having a lot of soft skills and teamwork. So again, teamwork's useful in college as well um, as in the real world. But the big difference I think is that there's no more like, there's no more shortcuts. Like in the real world, you either get the job done or you don't get the job done. I think in academia, it's like, as soon as you take your exams, um, you're done. Like you've learned this topic, you washed your hands of it, you know, when you're done, you're out. Um, the real world, you have to keep doing that every single day. And it's never going to end because that's kind of your job. So students versus real world workers, I think the skills are almost the same. But I think in school, it's a whole lot easier to make yourself look better than it is in the real world kind of work environment. And then how is the transition from college to businesses? Uh, I think this depends on your your position. So I've worked in a lot of different areas. Um, quantitative finance wise, though, the transition is a little bit challenging um, because while you have to be at work at specific times, just like at school, showing up to class, um, a lot of times at work, you're on your own and you're required to do things from your own thinking, figuring out what's next. You're not always going to have someone like giving you assignments. So being in the real world, the people that will excel and do well are those that can think on their own, assign their own work and get things done. Um, kind of my thoughts on the transition. I like being in the real world better than academia for that reason that you kind of have to like motivate yourself and get it done but anyways next question here um which languages both programming and normal are you proficient in and how important were they for your career okay so normal languages i'm going to assume are like speaking languages i only speak english i do not speak any other language um would it be beneficial for me yeah i think it would <laughs> to be honest with you a lot of my colleagues come from china or india being able to speak their native language might make the communication better. Um, is it required? No, I think English is the most important language because almost everybody uses it. It's kind of like the universal language. Um, so that's normal languages. Programming languages, um, the most important programming language for my career has been SAS. Um, I know this is weird to say because in financial engineering programs, you typically do like R, Python, C++. Um, but for working on the model development side, almost all large banks are using SaaS. If you were to work in like a hedge fund and you were going to be optimizing things or you work in like implementation, using Python and C++ for speed is much more crucial. So you need to know that. Um, proficiency wise, that's a tough one. Right now, my main proficiencies are going to be SaaS, Python, and R. I mainly use SaaS for almost everything, so it's really hard to switch gears back into Python and back into R. I used to program in C++ many, many years ago. I used to be proficient, but I'm not gonna say I'm proficient at this point because it would take me a few months to kind of get going again. Um, programming is one of those things I feel like you don't forget it, but it does take you a little bit of time to get back up to speed to where you were when you started. Um, the next question here, what are the most important soft skills in finance jobs in general? So finance jobs in general, communication is the number one soft skill here. Um, if you can communicate well, you will do very well. I think the second most important soft skill though is going to be presentation. So being able to present yourself as like professional, well-educated, helpful, like coming off as very well polished is challenging, especially for most people in quantitative finance. For traditional finance, um, it's still a challenge, I believe, to be kind of in that top kind of tier here of being like well-rounded and looking polished and professional again. But I think those are probably the two main soft skills. Um, what are the types of persons that suited for finance jobs? And it says you have to know how to deal with pressure, kind of like hinting at like what they're looking for here. Um, people that are best suited for just general finance jobs are people that are probably team players and well-rounded. I know this sounds weird. So this is like traditional finance. Traditional finance is going to be focused more around like Excel skills, SQL skills, and team building skills. Um, understanding your products 
So in finance, you always have some product you're working with, whether it's loans, investments. Um, those are gonna make you more suited for finance. I think those that are driven and are like really energetic people will be great for finance and perseverance. I think it's kind of the basic skills though for every job. Um, for quantitative finance, I think the person type varies, but you have to be someone that has to dig deep. Like you can't just say like, oh, the answer is this and then be willing to move on. Um, people in finance and even quantitative finance are people that want to dig deeper. Like, yes, I know this is the answer, but why is it the answer? Like, how did you get that? Um, is there anything affecting that answer? If there's something that changes in our markets or our like business or our customers, how does that affect it? Uh, I think people in finance have to just be like problem solving experts, someone that digs deep to get to the final solution. So I guess that kind of answers your question there. Um, and then the final question here is, hey Dimitri, should I pursue an MBA or get a job as a junior equity analyst at a HF? So I'm gonna assume that's hedge fund here. Um, I have an opportunity to make 60K a year right now, but it would be full time and I would have to put pursuing a master's on hold. What should I do? Okay, so this is pretty easy. This is traditional finance, not quant finance. You should take the job making 60K. I'd work it for two years. Um, the reason being is to get a top MBA program, which is what you're looking to do here. Um, you need two years of experience to get into a top MBA. If you wanna get into any MBA program, just generic, you can go right after uh, college, but to get into a top MBA, you need two years. So I would take the job, work it for two years, then apply to a top MBA program like Wharton or like Ross, um, there's a whole bunch of them, Booth, like Stern, all kinds of programs. Just go out there and apply after your two years of experience, uh, get the MBA, and then go back and you should be set up pretty well for a successful career in banking and finance and trading. Anyways, that's all the questions I've got from you guys. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.